Yeah. This is the relevant podcast. It's Tuesday, September 21. 2021. <laughs> that was September 21, 2021. And it's a relevant podcast here in Orlando. I'm your host, Cameron Strang. And joining me from Loverland, Virginia, it's Jesse Carey. Hello, hello. From Nashville, Tennessee, artist, producer, mogul, Derek Miner. What up, dog? And sitting in with us once again for Jamie Ivey is author, counselor, speaker from LA, Kristen Howerton. Hey, guys. Hey, welcome back. We're excited to have you. So well, we have a great show coming up for you. Uh, later, we talk to pastor and author John Mark Comer. And also, we have Slices. And at the end of the show, we have a brand new game that Tyler wrote for us. I can't wait for you guys to have to Yay. do it. So, let's <laughs> go later. All right. Well, how do we feel, Jesse? How do we feel about this two-a-week podcast thing? We're now in our third week of it. How is it working out for you? You like the rhythm? Yeah, I mean, I you know got uh, you know a lot of a lot of material that I get to workshop here. Uh, you know, last week I, twice the material. You know, yeah, last week I was sitting on a lot of Bat Boy tabloid tabloid and housemates need uh, stuff and got to workshop yeah. it last week. Got to and workshop so, it on uh, Friday show. Yeah. Feel pretty good about that. Uh, you can tell it's uh, it's prime time material when when the housemates needs jokes come out. So uh, pretty good, pretty good. Getting a lot of reps, <laughs> as they say. It is true with two, with twice the uh, shows we have twice the uh, you know uh, opportunity for you to tell us what's going on uh, in the deep uh, recesses right, so, of your brain. So hold on one second though before we go further. Mm -hmm. Now mm -hmm. <clears throat> last week Jesse was talking about uh, Grandpa's neck and uh, all these other ailments that he had. No, they were all it was mommy thumb mommy. and housemaid's <laughs> knee that he has been these are quote, verifiable unquote, medically diagnosed medical with. conditions. Listen, so he sends yeah. an article. To, to back up uh -huh. his conditions, right? Uh -huh. Guys, the first, the headline says this, mother's thumb, how to ease wrist pain after pregnancy. So <laughs> how did thing. you get it's this? A lot of us, a lot of us you deal are not with pregnant. it. Derek. You have never been pregnant. How did you get this, Jesse? How did you get this? I need answers right now. The, the, the doctors called it a reverse medical miracle. Um, I don't know if they've, they've <laughs> never seen it before. It's uh, it's shocking, um, oh and it's very concerning. <laughs> uh, but they said this is the miracle. exact opposite of a medical miracle. We've never seen anything like this. So they you, know, now, you as a male are getting ailments know. that only go to females. This mm -hmm. is a miracle. You were the first uh, male to. He was also diagnosed get, with a tipped uterus. I heard. Yes. Yeah, that, it's, that was. Yeah, what other that female was very, diseases yeah. do you have, Jesse? Yeah. yeah, I mean that's uh, you know it's all you know I'm a petri dish for science right now. They're very excited, <laughs> uh, but equally concerned about my. If conditions. you are a petri dish, maybe that's why you're getting all these diseases. Might yeah, I've, eat, I've eaten a lot of dust for a diet, yeah. as yeah. Kristen recommended last week. And, uh, all right, well we have a lot to get to today, so uh, stay tuned. Up next, it slices. I was lying in my bed A creature void of form Been so afraid of everything I need a chance to be reborn I never wanted anything That someone had to give you're listening to The War on Drugs and Lucius. The song is I Don't Live Here Anymore. Where are you in my kitchen? Okay, it's time for Slices. What do you have our walking reverse medical miracle, <laughs> Jesse? Yeah, science is just, you know, it's an amazing thing. You're um, a walking reverse miracle, my friend. I think of that right. every day. That's right. So uh, CBS, the television network, uh, found themselves in the center of a controversy this week when they announced their new reality TV show competition. And I want to hear your guys' opinion on it because I have one that might not, you know, it's kind of going against the norm because this show got a lot of backlash when Deadline announced the official show synopsis, which I'm going to go ahead and read uh, a portion of here. It's called The Activist, and it's a competition show that features uh, six aspiring activists teamed up with three three high profile public figures working together to bring meaningful change to one of three vitally important world, uh, world causes, health, education, and the environment. 
In the show, activists will go head-to-head in challenges to promote their causes with their success measured via online engagement, social metrics, uh, and the the host's input. Uh, The three teams will have one ultimate goal, to to create impactful movements that amplify their message, drive action, and advance them to the G20 summit in Rome, uh, where they can meet with world leaders and try uh, to pitch their ideas and get financial support. So uh, once this show was announced, uh, you know, kind of TV critics uh, pretty much all had the same take, which is this is performative activism at its worst. That Ooh. it's even how they're measuring the success of the competitors, which is through mainly through uh, social engagement and online metrics. Um, you know, and then also the prize itself, which isn't even like, hey, ten thousand dollars to the best idea to help one of these causes. It's a chance to go and talk to world leaders about your uh, cause, and hopefully, in addition to the recognition that affords you, to try to drum up some additional financial resources to support the cause. Now, I think all of those criticisms are, are valid. It is performative activism, but you're talking to someone who once listened to Nickelback for a week straight to raise money for <laughs> uh, building clean water wells. So I don't know if I'm I'm someone who should criticize, even though that was kind of a joke to, to kind of make fun of performative activism. But at the same time, you know, I understand the criticisms for this show, which have been widespread um, because it, it, it combines the celebrity aspect too. Um, and I think those concerns are legitimate. But I also don't know if this is like the worst idea in the world. Like, I don't necessarily think that, you know, just because... I think performative activism and, 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 and awareness campaigns are better than no activism and no awareness mm-hmm. campaigns. Like, I feel like, look, this is a primetime television slot that's going to go to something. Like, it's this is CBS. We know that this is either going to be like the next two and a half men a, or a Big CSI. Brother house. Yeah, yeah, or, yeah, or exactly. yeah, good Lord, CSI, you know, Omaha or whatever. Like, <laughs> it's going to be a spinoff of 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 some. You know, it's that slot is going to be filled with something, right. and I think all of the concerns about the construct of this show are valid. But I don't think it invalidates the entire idea that we should dedicate a half hour of prime time or an hour of prime time television for five straight weeks to raise awareness of, about causes, even if you know the execution is imperfect. I I, I don't necessarily think it's a terrible thing, even though I do think conceptually it has flaws. What do you guys think about this? I think the fact that it's a competition is the issue. Like, mm. like they could have done a myriad of things besides put them in a gauntlet to fight one another to see whose activism campaign is the best. Because the reality is all of the, everybody, all of those activism campaigns are probably quality campaigns. So the fact that one need has to go against one another it kind of shows kind of our perspective today like i i know when you know like when i was talking when when i talk about things about like you know uh police brutality and things of that nature then someone will say well what about this you're not campaigning for this and it just really reinforces that to me i maybe i might be triggered a little bit but it's like yeah we we can talk about lgbtq rights and black rights and we could talk about uh uh native american rights and we could talk about people on the border being put in cages we talk about all those things and all those things are valid and they all need to be funded and we all need to focus on trying to fix all of those things as opposed to saying all right well sorry lgbtq community black people raise more uh awareness so we're just gonna throw that to the corner over there you know like i think there's the issue for me you know but that may not be how they do this so you know we haven't seen the show hopefully they thought about that and just aren't completely oblivious and foolish but who knows it'll be good entertainment this is i mean the competitive thing isn't new i mean 10 years ago pepsi did a a million dollar giveaway where they were going to give a charity a million dollars and it was a charity that got the most votes online you know so they had this big gala and it ended up being that a friend of ours jamie twakowski at right love on arms they ended up winning the million dollars but it was a huge popularity contest which felt exactly like what you were yeah. talking about, where it's like everybody's voting for their favorite pet cause as opposed to that feels icky you know. to me though. Like that yeah. feels really, really icky to say. 
I'm going to choose for Pepsi, this. It was just a huge thing of come to Pepsi.com and register to vote. And then now you're on our marketing exactly. list. So for Pepsi, it was, it was a corporate, you know, exactly. play. But hey, Right Love actually did get a million dollars and put it to use yeah. um, to reach more people about mental health and suicide prevention. So yeah. good did come out of it, but it felt icky in the meantime, you know. I wonder if the competition thing is just like them having to fit this somehow into the structure of a reality show because just about right. every reality show is a competition. So it kind of feels like when my kids were little, I wanted them to eat spinach. So I'd put it in a smoothie and then it's like, no, it's a smoothie. But then now they're eating spinach. Like, I don't know. Maybe I'm giving it too much credit. Yeah, hopefully you're not. I don't know if that's a totally unfair analogy because I feel like this has been a method of a lot of different pa people who are passionate about you know, certain causes, but happen to be skilled in other areas. I mean, you look at, so yeah, you look at like the Bono's red campaign back right. in the day, which was he partnered with a bunch of brands to put this red label on. Still going, man. And, yeah. I mean, there's yeah, red and, Apple products that were announced this week. I mean, and, 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 and like initially, and I think, you know, even today, they have a lot of critics that like, well, you know, I shouldn't, we we should just be able to give and support causes we're passionate about and it shouldn't be tacked on to some something involving consumerism and consumption but it's like hey at the end of the day even if that's your opinion red raises a lot of money for causes Thanks. could it raise more sure but so could the average person just deciding to give a hundred dollars a month to you know in global poverty but the reality is that's probably not going to happen and i think an imperfect you know, idea who's that's well intentioned is better than poorly intentioned ideas. You know, like I don't think it's perfect, but I don't know if it's worthy of all the criticism it's gotten. And maybe it is, but I, I don't know. Well, I don't feel mm. like I have a lot of room to criticize because I'm actively watching a show right now called Bachelor in Paradise, where there's a yeah. room called the Boom Boom Room. Well, so yeah. <laughs> I sit and watch that by choice. <laughs> This does it, sound problematic, but still elevated above what I'm. Ex exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. weird, the weird thing I, I read about this upcoming uh, competition is that uh, the charity competition will also have a boom boom room. I don't know why. Oh, but, okay. Well, that will get people Listen, to tune in. You got to get viewers. You got to get viewers. Yeah. You know, yeah. like, but but Kristen, to that point, like. The, a lot of the same TV critics who, you know, will kind of criticize a show like this will probably not be all that, you know, vocal when Netflix does its next dumb dating show with, you know, when they're wearing. But on this dating show, they have to wear a mask and look like an animal or whatever. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, hey, it's like but they're it. just. It's better That's what think. I'm saying. They're just throwing. <laughs> Don't knock they're, it. they're just throwing random ideas at the wall, and one producer is like, "Hey, we should do one of these random ideas, but make make reward the best, the, the most effective activist." Like that doesn't, on its surface, sound that bad to me. You right. Know? Yep. All right. What do you have, Derek? So, um, somehow, in the year 2021. Somebody is getting scammed on eBay with some Beanie Babies. <laughs> I, I oh, never, no. like, I'm going to be real How with y'all. still around? Like, that's what I'm saying. I'm going to keep it gangster with y'all. Like, I never in my life thought I would utter that sentence in 2021. But somehow, <laughs> people are getting scammed on eBay uh, over Beanie Babies. Now, I mean, people that maybe like, you know, born in the 90s. I don't know. Well, maybe born in the 2000s. Uh, Beanie Babies became really, really popular to the point where, I mean, stock market blew, their stock blew up, everything blew up. I mean, stuff was, these little babies were selling for, you know, tens of thousands of dollars, right? Um, well, now that's what's happening on e eBay, but there's a catch. So there was one that sold for like $25,000 on eBay and then it popped, it popped off and then it came back like the next day. And they were selling it for $17,000. So that made people start thinking like, hmm, maybe something nefarious is going on. Turns out, I'm going to read the post, what they actually said could be happening. Um, Vice did an uh, expose on this, and they said that those are bogus. Uh, this is a Beanie Baby historian, uh, Schlossberg, 
says that those are bogus. A historian of Beanie Babies who runs the website Tie Collector with his daughter told Motherboard, you'll see somebody who lists a Beanie Baby for $14,000. they will have an accomplice buy it and then they'll cancel the transaction and it'll disappear from eBay. Legitimate Beanie Baby collectors have a theory. It's either money laundering or bogus transactions. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. So that got me to think, especially since we're talking about TV money shows, laundering. that'd be the heck of a TV show. Like, yes. like people selling drugs, but they're like like doing this with beanie babies but it really kind of well, this is the next the next season of ozark maybe marty bird yeah. gets into the beanie baby money laundering right. it's actually a great solution for him it actually is <laughs> <laughs> my brother's hey, well i've never it's a great mother you know we ever watch those shows yeah like the, the ozarks or you know one of those money heists like doc, right. you know true crime documentaries on netflix or whatever and it's always it's never about the crime it's they all it's the money they never know what to do with their money and they never launder it right it always yep. comes back yep. every one of these shows and it's the same way they got you know they successfully pulled off the heist right. or they successfully smuggled the drugs or whatever but they have all this money and they can't launder it <laughs> The Beanie Baby thing is actually pretty brilliant because who's to say this Beanie Baby is not worth fourteen thousand dollars or whatever? Like you could just assign a value to it. Uh, well, and, Jesse, and there are historians. Some... There are Beanie it's, Baby it's I... He runs a site with his daughter, and he it is very official. <laughs> but here's the thing for me: I, if I was a police officer, I would keep it gangster. If I saw. Like if you come into, you know, I'm interrogating you and it's like, all right, man, we busted you. And, and he's like, no, I was just buying Beanie Babies. How much you buy a Beanie Baby for? $25,000. I'm like, oh, you definitely selling drugs. You going to jail. Because I'm like, this don't, th- there's there's no way in the world. NFTs <laughs> are going for that. If not, way, 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 way more. NFT that's stuff. based I mean, off of cryptocurrency, Baseball bro. cards. Baseball cards are as well. Baseball cards are going bonkers Bruh, right now. And they're selling for tens of thousands of Look, dollars. I'm going to say it in the most black country way I can say, but ain't nobody buying no beanie babies for $25,000. <laughs> you feel what I'm saying? I'm letting you know. It, it does It does feel like it, it feels like the the Beanie Baby market is is not dissimilar from like the cryptocurrency <laughs> market where the value is just implied value. Right, it's right, like, right. I, it's worth this much because someone is willing to pay this much. Like, does it? Its value isn't intrinsic. Like, it's not. It's not but like unless you're gasoline. on the gold standard. That that's all things. I mean, we assign a value to this piece of paper because. But 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 I mean, like commodities actually have utilitarian yeah. value, right? Yeah, like, commodities it, like gold. Like, like like tangible yeah, yeah. Re- real tangible yeah. things but that's very few and far between in in our economy i mean most things are just arbitrarily assigned to value why is this one watch going to cost me two hundred thousand dollars and this watch costs twenty dollars i mean you, there's some craftsmanship but but, and, but 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 there's still but but i mean you could look at things like scarcity or other right. other elements that determine value precious metal you know there, there are other kind yeah. of there, there's kind of other long-standing um things that we use to create some sort of monetary value, even if that value inflates or deflates based on economic conditions, but something like a beanie baby, it's like, it doesn't do anything. It's just, it just, it, it, so that does make it like a perfect thing to, uh, if you wanted to launder money with, I think I, Chris, I love your idea of like the drug dealing banker, like going to the cartel leader's house and just pops open the suitcase. And it's just a bunch of Panda bear, rare Panda bear, beanie babies you know like <laughs> right. that or like it's very like you know when you you know in those movies where they tear they pull down the drywall at the drug dealer's mansion yeah. and just like stacks of dollar bills fall out i really want to see the version of that movie where it's just beanie babies just hidden inside the walls <laughs> you know for the for the for the cartel yeah all right uh what do you have Kristen? all right well jeff bezos um of amazon fame um You know, there's an old saying that says the two sure things in life are that you're going to pay taxes and you're going to die. And Jeff Bezos is saying, I'm not going to do either of those things. So he is, (laughs) (laughs) he is, he's actively working on 
um, with a company that is trying to create eternal life. He is there saying that death is a problem that we can solve. And Jeff, with his infinite amounts of money, um, did not say poverty or health care <laughs> are things he wants to solve. He wants to prolong life for rich people because, of course, this is going to be monetized. Of course, this is not oh, yeah. something that's going to benefit Gen Pop. It's him and a bunch of really wealthy cronies investing in this company that is going to, I don't know, pickle them. I, I have no idea. <laughs> what I do know is we, you know, we talked, <laughs> we talked earlier Hold about up, like, Christy, you just said that they go pickle this man. Pickle I don't know. I mean, I don't know how this is going to work. Listen, we talked about the, the indignities of growing older. He already looks like he's been pickled. I mean, he kind of has the shape of a pickle. Like, <laughs> like who wants to be in this body past the expiration date, right? Like I, things are already falling apart for me. I'm in my mid forties. Like I just feel like this. You hurt your suit. feet sleeping. I mean, I, my yeah, feet I mean, hurt from 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 sleeping. They hurt in the morning after inactivity. <laughs> Jesse got mama's thumb. He ain't even pregnant. <laughs> I don't know. It's yeah, so it's... weird. And, and it's like you hear that he's going to do something in healthcare, and it's like, oh my gosh, maybe he's going to like cure cancer, or he's going to like give people mental health coverage. She's like, no, he's still going to do something douchey. He's still <laughs> just going to do something out of touch. And dumb, this yeah, guy. I, I haven't, I haven't trusted him since he unironically wore that oversized Indiana Jones hat on that space flight. Oh, the gosh. man who, who unironically wears that hat is not trustworthy. It was a cowboy hat. Opinion. It wasn't an Indiana really? Jones hat. It was a cowboy. Okay, hat. Trust it was, nobody cowboy. Was, it was a weird. He was hybrid. literally a space cowboy. That's what he was wanting to do. It was very concerning. Look for me. Very concerned. I just feel like he, he, the guy has no shame. Like, I feel like he should be embarrassed by some of these ideas because it feels like if you gave a 10 year old boy, like he, a 10 year old boy won the lottery and you said, what are you going to do? He would be like, I'm going to go into space go space and I'm going to yeah. live forever. You know, it, <laughs> it just, it's so juvenile and embarrassing. I, I just want one of these rich billionaires to do what the world's really been waiting for, to mm -hmm. loudly grab the microphone and say, today we will find a cure and we will end Mommy Thumb I for, knew you for, <laughs> for, for anyone who is suffering from this. Any, literally just anyone. Just keep banging that not drum just, for your people. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, some, hopefully one of these billionaires will wake up. It's it really epidemic. is. It's the uh, hidden epidemic. Hey, it's jumped genders. <laughs> I mean, it's spreading so prolifically. It's it's, it's, it's left. It's it's, it's mutating jumping. to Ooh, men. This is the Delta variant of mommy thumb, man. <laughs> going to the men. On this topic, though, I do want to give a shout out to Relevant for doing the ultimate Jesus juke on this one. With like, well, Jeff Bezos, we already have the gift of eternal life through our Lord oh, and yeah. Savior Jesus oh, Christ. Yeah. Oh, that, yeah. was, yeah. that was pretty yeah. epic. The great Jesus <laughs> juke for sure. Pretty good. <laughs> really good one. <laughs> All right. Well, that'll do it for slices. Stay tuned. Up next, John Mark. Comer joins us. You. None of that love there from before. None of my clothes left on your floor. Que fácil te salió el adiós. Así que vete con Dios. I thought you might this one was none. My tears will try on their own. Listen to me before I go. Cause I don't you know I live for you, baby. You're listening to Maria Isabel. The song is Baby. Dot, dot, dot. Well, today's show is also brought to you by UHSM. I know we're all tired of the rising costs of healthcare, and that's why we're so happy to share a little bit about WeShare. WeShare is a health sharing program powered by UHSM, a Christian health sharing ministry. Health sharing is not insurance. These programs are member-based fellowships where faithful people exercise their right to take charge of their own health care. Learn more about how WeShare is restoring faith in health care at WeShare.org. That's WeShare.org. Well, our guest today is John Mark Comer. John founded Bridgetown Church in Portland, where he serves as lead pastor. He's the author of numerous books, including God Has a Name, Loveology, My Name is Hope, and his newest book, Live No Lies. And if you look at them all side by side, they have a very connected, very cool cover design. <laughs> I, I like the intentionality of how he designs his uh, book covers. Well, John sat down with our very own Emily Brown to talk about how we can better resist the daily lies thrown at us and how to live a holy and restful life. Here is part of our conversation with John Mark Comer. We 
where did this book originate from? Like, what? how did you get started with this? You know, I mean, I grew up born and raised kind of on the West Coast. So I grew up in Bay Area and then moved to Portland. So I've spent my whole life in just a very secular, very progressive, very post-Christian kind of culture. And yet um, I'm a follower of Jesus. And so trying to figure out like how to make sense of the world, how to navigate a, a world that is you know, so far from Jesus' vision of human flourishing and, uh, and kind of hold to not just Christian orthodoxy, but to Jesus. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's kind of born out of that pain. And then the pastoral call of how do you pastor people? How do you shepherd people in a city that's just the, the, the atmosphere here, the, the soil of the city at a cultural level is so corrosive to any kind of faith, you know, or discipleship to Jesus. You know, so many Christians are, are basically secular in how they think about spirituality and Christianity, you know, quickly devolves to like a Christian version of Buddhism, kind of like a spiritual, how do you become a nice person and achieve inner peace, which is all great. I'm actually into a lot of that stuff. But um, we, we forget that this is a clash of kingdoms that we're part of in the teachings of Jesus, that the kingdom of God motif that is literally the central message of Jesus of Nazareth is at some level like a warfare motif and realizing that secularism isn't the entity, a, a enemy, you know, progressivism in my city or, you know, uh, conservatism in other cities or cultural contexts, that's actually not the enemy. People are not the enemy. There's an enemy behind the enemy or there's multiple of them, the world, the flesh and the devil. So just trying to like highlight that reality for my own personal life and for my pastoral life to help us figure out how to navigate and kind of flourish in this kind of a climate. I, I grew up in the church too. And, you know, I had heard about the devil, but I think even growing up, the idea of the devil was never really fleshed out well. Um, and I think that has caused a lot of issues too, is we use terms like the devil, the flesh and the world. Um, but we don't really know, like in scripture, we don't really kind of understand the context of what that is. So could you maybe explain a little bit more about each of the enemies and maybe an example of how they lie to us in different ways. When we think about the devil and, and, you know, you could sketch out, it would take a while to sketch out a biblical theology of this creature that, you know, in Genesis 1, 1 is arguably the kind of chaos monster on the, on the waters, the darkness over the waters, and then this serpent creature. And then by the time it's fully developed in the New Testament is this adversary to Jesus himself out in the wilderness. But However you grasp and understand who this creature is and where he comes from and where he is going, uh, what I kind of hone in on the book in, in on the book is that in Jesus, most kind of in-depth teaching on this creature and on his strategy against our soul and our society, which is in John chapter eight, there's that fascinating line where Jesus calls him the father of lies, uh, has this really interesting line. When he lies, he speaks his native language, ties it all back to the Garden of Eden story and the serpent and Adam and Eve and this story of deception that's at the root of kind of the human fall. And that's basically what Jesus has to say. And I that struck me as, wow, uh, when Jesus gives an in-depth teaching on the devil, he doesn't talk about all the things I would expect him to talk about. Demonization, natural disasters like a tsunami or cancer or illness or disease or a poltergeist or a terrifying nightmare, you know, for a, a little kid. Um, not that that stuff's not real. There's actually evidence for all of that stuff in the New Testament and thoroughly down through church history and in a lot of our own personal experience. But when Jesus hones in and gives his teaching on the devil, the primary thing that he's dealing with is this idea of lies and deception and the way it plays to the human mind and imagination. Sometimes the lies they feel like there's an like an air of truth to them. Obviously, I know you know money does not bring happiness. Um, I mean, money to an extent helps, but it does not bring pure yes. happiness. So there's things like that. You know, how do you identify a lie that there is some truth in it, but there's not full truth? 
Yeah, I mean, I, it's hard in our dogmatic kind of polarized right versus left, us versus them kind of anti-reason cultural moment that we're in. But um, I, I think you're absolutely right. That is the challenge of our time. And most good lies are mostly true. And if you think about, you know, a lot of cults that, you know, came to prominence over the last century or so, they're basically 95% in agreement with Christian Orthodox doctrine. But the 5% where they're off is like, you know, core. <laughs> it's like the nature of who Jesus is or the resurrection of the dead or, you mm -hmm. know, the 5% mm -hmm. where they're in error is like the linchpin, you know? And um, this is the great danger of ideology. And there are ideologies on the left that I would be incredibly familiar with just by virtue of living in Portland. And then there are ideologies on the right that other people, depending on where you live or what your digital algorithm is, you'd be more familiar with. But ideology, the best def definition I know of ideology is when you take a part of the truth and you make it the whole. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, communism would be a great example where you take something that's true, this idea of class struggle and oppressed and oppressor and kind of the struggle between the elites of society and, you know, the proletariat. But, but that, if you just take that as the whole truth and then overlay that over an entire nation's history and reality, at that point, it's no longer true. It's, it's because life is way more complex than that and uh, a thousand times more complex than that. And so it's not that it's not true that, you know, there are oppressed and oppressor and there's class struggle. It's that when you make that the whole truth, you now are in a, into a lie. Um, so all that to say, that's a great salient example at a meta level. But I think when we're in just interpersonal stuff or our own life, it's just always looking for that 5% that's off or looking for the yeah, but, or the yeah, and, or where has this critique or this idea or this value become an ideology? It's become not part of the truth, but the whole truth. And as a result, become untrue. You know, in your book, you talk about how acknowledging these or resisting and acknowledging these lies lead to peace. Um, so I would just like to hear, you know, since you've started um, identifying and resisting the lies in this way, how has your life changed? Like, how has that affected your life by, by changing your thought life? Yeah, well, let's take it out of an individual kind of frame, which is all of our default setting as Westerners, and put it back into a Jesus, kingdom of God, four gospels frame. You know, there's these two, there's this kind of clash of kingdoms between the kingdom of God and what the writer Paul in the New Testament calls the kingdom of darkness. And the reign of God, which is a, arguably a better translation of the kingdom, the reign of God, the rule of God is a reign of peace. And the reign of, you know, the reign of darkness, the kingdom of darkness is one of chaos and fear and violence and anger and division and disunity. And so the more that we can bring our mind and through that our whole body, our sexuality, our gender, our money, our interpersonal relationships, our speech, um, our dress, all that we are, the more that we can bring that under the reign of Jesus through our voluntary act of discipleship to him and, and what you know Paul in Romans 12 calls true and proper worship, um, the more we experience his peace. John Mark Comer. Make sure to check out more from him over at relevantmagazine.com. Okay, stay tuned up next. It's our new game, Rotten Tomatoes. We know that hope is never lost. Oh, for there is still an empty grave. God, we believe no matter what, there is
You're listening to CC Winans and Lauren Daigle. It's her new single, Believe For It. So inspirational. Love that song. Okay, it's time for Rotten Tomatoes, the game. Hey! All right, well, I'm right. I'm going to read Tyler's copy. Don't blame me. Here we go. It's fall movie season now, and that means studios are rolling out their most star studded fare in an attempt to win the hearts of audiences and maybe even Oscar gold. Movies like The Green Knight, Spencer, and The Eyes of Tammy Faye will face off this award season, and the most important judges are the critics. For people like us, the easiest way to track how critics are feeling is Rotten Tomatoes, the movie review aggregator that keeps track of what percentage of positive reviews a movie gets. A movie that gets over 60% positive is called Certified Fresh. Anything under that is rotten. In this game, each player will compete to see how well they understand the critical landscape of Hollywood. You will be given two well-known mainstream movies, and you simply have to guess which one has the higher Rotten Tomatoes score. The person who guesses the most correctly will be crowned the Hollywood champion of the relevant podcast. So, pretty straightforward. I'm going to give you two. You tell me which one got the highest Rotten Tomatoes score and why you think so. Got it? Got it. Yep. Got it. All right. Jesse, you're up first. Your two movies okay. are Toy Story 2 and Shrek. I'm going to go with Toy Story 2. Toy Story 2 had a 100% Rotten Tomato score. What? 100% positive. Wow. 100%. I think Shrek. I, I went I went with that because Shrek has a Smash Mouth song and there's just... <laughs> Shrek had 88%. Critic, critic. Still highly rated. Sorry. Still highly rated. Yep. All right. So one point for Jesse. Uh, Clark, you're keeping score. Help me. All right. Uh, Derek, you're up. What up? The Matrix or Die Hard? The Matrix. The Matrix had an 88 Rotten Tomato score. Die Hard, 94%. Die Hard is the correct answer. They nailed it. The critics the critics knew what's up there. Yeah. All right, Kristen. Sleepless in Seattle or My Best Friend's Wedding? Oh, boy. Sleepless in Seattle. Best Friend's Wedding had 73. Sleepless in Seattle, 75. Oh, rough 75. crowd. Oh, oh man. Yeah. 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 yeah this you got well. it. Just barely. All right, Jesse. Do the right thing or the Royal Tenenbaums? Oh, man. As much as I love Royal Tenenbaums, I feel like do the right thing is is unassailable. One, you know, Spike Lee's, you know, really First kind of, of all, coming out. The Royal Tenenbaums, 81% fresh. Okay, 81. Okay. I am I'm not say, pleased with that. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. Do the right thing, 93%. Okay. 93%. You're correct. All right. Derek, The Breakfast Club or What's Eating Gilbert Grape? And I'll tell you this, this is very close. We're going to go to the Breakfast Club. Breakfast Club had 89%. What's eating Gilbert Grape? 90%. Beat it up oh, by one, one point. Yeah. All right, Kristen, you're up. Ocean's Eleven from 2001 or Castaway? Wait, what's Castaway? Is that the... It's Wilson. It's the Wilson. It's the Tom yes, Hanks yeah, okay, on yeah, a yeah, desert yeah. island. Yeah. And Ocean's Eleven. Was that the first one? Yeah, the yeah. original yeah. one in 2001. Okay. S- Steve Brad Soderbergh. Pitt, George Clooney. Yep. Yeah. I'm going to go Ocean's Eleven. Ocean's Eleven at 83%. Castaway had 89%. Hmm. See, see th- this answer. is where it falls apart. This shows the flaws of this. Because if you guys, if someone's like, hey, you want to come over tonight? And we're, we're hanging out and Castaway's on. It's like, well, this is kind of a drag. Yeah. It's just Tom Hanks <laughs> making a fire for like half hour. Like it's not, no, no one's rewatching. No one's like, hey, it feels like a Castaway night. No one is saying that. <laughs> hey, Ocean's when TBS, Eleven on? <laughs> when TBS is playing like Friday nights at 1 a.m. Ocean's Eleven, I'm watching it. You're, you, yeah. know? you can Thanks. jump in halfway through that movie and you're like, like this movie's Facts. awesome. It's like, awesome. I'm enjoying. Wa- I could watch twenty. I could watch a twenty minute window of Ocean's Eleven and want to wear like a dress shirt with one shirt button unbuttoned. Castaway just makes me kind of bummed out. Yeah. Like, oh man, that'd be really <laughs> that suck to be on an island that long. Like that's all it does. Like I, I disagree with the critics here. All right. Speaking of a situation that would suck in a movie, uh, Titanic. This is for you, Jesse. Titanic okay. or Shakespeare in Love. Oof. I'm gonna. You know, I think I I, th- I think Shakespeare and what Love won an Oscar that year, and I think Gwyneth Paltrow might have been she nominated or won. Won, she did win. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to go Shakespeare and Love. Yeah, Shakespeare and Love had 92 percent. Titanic 89 percent. You're correct. You're three wow. three for three, man. Jesse got this rating system down. All right, uh, Derek. Here we go. I the know. Notebook or Hitch. 
It's very different Two movies. classics. Bro, why? Yeah. Why are you? Criterion you know, collection you material. For this, bro. You said The Notebook or Hitch. Uh-huh. Man, I'm just finna go with Big Willie, man. With Hitch. Safe bet. Hitch had 69%. <gasps> the Notebook, 53% for The Notebook. What? You are correct. <laughs> hey, no I, can I, critics like The I Notebook. Always bet on black. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> the, this should just be, did it get better than Hitch? That's who this is, and it should be. It should be movies that were right in that sixty percent. Mm-hmm. That's my sweet spot for Rotten Tomatoes. Because if if it's over ninety, you know, it's it's going to be a good movie. But it's, it's probably going to be like away. homework. It's going to yeah. be homework. Like yeah. ah, it's really great, but it's you know, I want something that turned off a lot of people. Like forty percent of people are like, no, 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 no. But sixty were like, hey, it's not too bad. That's where my more I sweet spot. You know, so Hitch is sixty nine percent. That's your. That's your. That's your. That's your, the bar uh, right there. The bar right that's there. The bar. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, uh, who's up, Krista? Here we go. Bad Boys or Bad Boys 2? Oh. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Derek's face is like, there's not even a question here. Uh, okay. I'm I'm going to go original. Okay. Bad Boys 2 had 23%. <gasps> bad wow. Boys had 42%. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> 23% for Bad Boys 2? <laughs> Uh, but, hey, but that makes my point man, like bro. bad boys in the 40 to 60 that's where your sweet spot is because bad boys is awesome <laughs> but 60 percent of critics are like this movie's terrible but you're like no 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 i'm going with that those weirdo bad 40 boys, 42 all right wow. uh, okay jesse guardians of the galaxy or forrest gump and i'll tell you this it's not even close there's like 21 Wait. points between the two i'm gonna say I, i'm gonna say guardians of the galaxy took it forrest gump had 71 percent Guardians of the Galaxy, 92%. <laughs> <You're correct. laughs> Millennials. <laughs> or, uh, Generation Z or whatever. But again, it's the homework thing. Like, hey guys, you want to come over and watch Forrest Gump? We're going to watch it no. right after Castaway. It's like, oh. no, but Guardians of the Galaxy is like, oh, that movie's kind of cool. Well, uh, why not? There's a I'm talking there. raccoon. I, I, I'm <laughs> in, baby. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They got laser guns and stuff, man. It's going to be awesome. They, it, has a, it ends with a dance-off, okay? Yeah. Like, I'm watching. Yeah, I'm, I'm in. in there. <laughs> All right, Derek. Yeah. This is right in your alley. Okay. Black Panther or Spider Man into the Spider Verse. Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> I'm going Spider Man. Black Panther had 96%. Spider Man into the Spider Verse, 97%. Huh. You're correct. <laughs> oh, yeah. They're two excellent movies. They're amazing. All right, no Kristen. Uh, this is this is our era. This is your era. Here we go. High fidelity or almost famous? Oh. Two great indie music movies. You High know this is tough because famous. you think about the movies when they came out, but then the people using yeah. Rotten Tomatoes are watching right. it like way later, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. If, yeah. I mean, the no, internet no, no, no. wasn't no, it's invented. An aggregator, no, it's an aggregator of the critics' reviews oh, at that at the time. time. Okay. They're just updating their older database. Okay, got yeah. it. That makes sense. Oh. I'm going to go High Fidelity. Almost Famous at 89%. High Fidelity, 91%. 91% High Fidelity. All right, Jesse. Here we go. Paddington 2 or Schindler's List? Paddington 2 is one of the most critically acclaimed films of all time and used to be the only 100% on Rotten Tomato. Uh, It's definitely Paddington 2. Schindler's List had 98%. Paddington 2 had 99%. Crazy. Yeah. What? That's crazy. Yeah, I've yeah. never seen it. I, Is it that I good? I watched it one time. I watched it one time out of curiosity. There's a lot of marmalade talk. That's pretty much my my take. Kristen, have you seen uh, Paddington Two? No, but I only know of Paddington Two because of what you just said. Because I know yeah. that it was like the highest rated movie on there for a while. But I yeah. still haven't watched yeah. it. I have no interest. Yeah. Is it a talking stuffed animal? I don't want to see literally, that. Cool. It literally, yeah, is. but I, I watch it for that fact. Like okay. I have to see what all the fuss is about. Yeah. This looks and it's okay. I mean, it's 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 Paddington Bear. You know what I mean? <laughs> like it is. It just it's very very good. It's awesome. being a Paddington Bear. Did you movie. watch Paddington you know I mean? one first, and were you able to follow? <laughs> I was totally lost. They might as well have been speaking French. In fact, the version I saw, I'm pretty sure, was a French version because okay. I downloaded it illegally. And, it's uh, it's yeah. nuanced. It's difficult. Yeah. It's, it's a I figured movie. Most of, mostly what I know is French movies do very well, so I figured I was just missing something. But yeah, uh, yeah I, I could, I could kind of keep up. I could, I could kind of keep up. All right, Derek, Friday or Anchorman? 
This see y'all are wrong for this. I'm going with my boy Cube though. I gotta go with Cube. I I know I might get it wrong, but Friday. Anchorman go, had sixty six percent, right? Just a sweet spot. Anchorman 66%. Friday, 78%. Critics loved Friday. I can't believe that. Yo, it's one of the best movies ever made. Yeah, it's one of the best movies ever made. But but critics would look down their nose at it. That's what I'm saying. It's not an audience score. Yeah. That's why I was nervous. I was like, uh, but okay, that's what's up. That's what's up. All right, Kristen. Knocked up or 300, the Russell (laughs) Crowe. You know, yes. from Gladiator movie. G- Gerard like Butler. That. Yeah. I like Gerard Butler. The poor, right, the poor right, man's right. Russell Crowe. The poor right. man's Russell Knocked Crow. up. Yeah. Okay. 300. 300. Uh, this, is, this is a weird matchup. I'm going to say knocked up. 300 had 61%, right? Okay. And Jesse Sweet Spot. Knocked up. 89% oh. of critics enjoyed knocked up. Can't believe it. All right, Jesse. This one's tough. It's I, I've not seen either of these movies because I don't watch this Ten. kind of movie. The Silence of the Lambs or The Shining. Uh, it is. It's almost. I'm. I'm very confident in this one. It's Silence of the Lambs. The Shining at eighty four percent. Silence of the Lambs ninety six percent. You're correct again. Yeah. Uh, all right. <laughs> this is crazy. You are running away with this one. All right, uh, Derek. Here we go. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, or The Sixth Sense. One Sixth Sense. Uh, Six Sense had 86%. Well reviewed mm-hmm. movie. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, 97%. All right. All right. And lastly, here we go. Uh, <laughs> Kristen, here we go. Fight Club or Pulp Fiction? Ooh. And I'll say it's it's 13 between the two of them. Okay. Fight Club or Pulp Fiction? Critical acclaim. Oh, gosh. They're both excellent movies. I'm going to say Fight Club. Fight Club had 79%. Pulp Fiction had 92%. What? Clark, what's our final score? Man, okay, so Jesse ran away with it uh, with five. Um, Derek had three and Kristen had four. So, I mean, actually, it was not too bad. It's close at the end. If she had done that, we would have had a runoff. Holy cow. And I want to I want to I want to be on record to know that I've been impaired with two serious medical ailments. Uh <laughs> housemates knee and a a novel variant of of mommy, mommy thumb. Thumb. So that just, yeah. you know. Why are you saying that? To say like you're you yeah. you're disabled and can't watch movies? I mean, I'm both just, of those just, ailments would make you watch it, more I movies. Just, I just think it's of note. That's all. I'm just trying to bring awareness. <laughs> Is there somewhere um, people can donate for mommy thumb or yeah, learn more information. Uh, I we'll just watch this new show to... that's coming up on CBS soon. Jesse's. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I'll be, be starring Usher. Bring Usher will help me, help me. And then if people want to Venmo me, I just put my Venmo. <laughs> I just painted it on the back of the window of my car when right. I drive around. So if people spot me, just shoot me a couple bones. And, uh, you know, everything helps in this battle. Score <laughs> update. Results. Actually, it was six for Jesse. So he did run six away for with Jesse. it. Pretty, yeah. Six Dang, for Jesse. Jesse. Good gracious. Dude, there you go. Holy cow. All right, that'll do it for Rotten Tomatoes, the game. Hey. All right, well, before we wrap things up, I want to thank John Mark Comer for joining us today. His newest book is called Live No Lies, and it's available on September 28th. It's coming up soon. Also, you know, as you know, because you're listening to this on Tuesday, we are back to two shows a week, Tuesday and Friday. Make sure to, um, you know, check out each episode, post about it, tell your friends, help us get word out that Relevant Podcast is back to two shows a week. Also, make sure to head over to relevantmagazine.com to check out the newest issue of the magazine. The fall digital issue is out now. We've got some incredible conversations with Jessica Chastain, Jennifer Hudson, Hillsong Young and Free, Andy Minio, Dr. Francis Collins. Um, the list goes on and on. Levi Lesko. There's so many people on the issue. Go check it out now. And many thanks to UHSM for their support. Also, make sure to follow Relevant on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram to keep up with what's new and, you know, to give us feedback, uh, submit questions for upcoming episodes or feedback for upcoming episodes. We want to hear from you. Make sure to follow us on all the socials. And uh, yeah, just 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 follow us because we have some stuff coming up that you're, you're going to want to be part of. Uh, Kristen, many thanks for joining us today. Uh, anything you want to plug before we wrap it up? Um, yeah, we're revamping selfie podcast. Um, and if you guys want to catch it, it is now two therapists, um, giving advice for all of your random mental health questions. 
do that you, is a fantastic do you tackle random physical ailments as well or just I mean listen we ailments? haven't talked about mommy's thumb yet and I do feel really bad and I want to formally apologize to Jesse because to the mommy I know thumb community yeah. not accepted and the, and the whole community continue. because you know it's an important topic that we haven't talked about <laughs> yeah. yet but I yeah. Jesse I'm going to do better I'm going to do better please please do we're going to put and, it in an upcoming um, episode <laughs> Yeah, For well, sure. that's that's the, the bare minimum, but thank you. Yeah. Uh, we, are <laughs> we are suffering every day. All right, well, no, no, we'll, we'll wrap Except it up. for me, I talk about it quite a bit. I'm Cameron Strang. I'm Jesse Carey. I'm Derek Miner. I'm Kristen Howerton. And we will see you on Friday. Have a great week, everyone. For listening to the relevant podcast check out our features interviews and news updates every day at relevantmagazine.com and make sure to follow relevant on facebook twitter and instagram for the latest for more great podcasts browse the shows on the relevant podcast network which you can find at our site and while you're there don't miss the all new era of relevant magazine a new issue releases every other month at relevantmagazine.com The doctors called it a reverse medical miracle. Relevant Podcast Network.